Did you find it? No. Well, have you tried prayer? The prayer room. Hmm. Wonder what I can find in here. Welcome back. It's great to see everyone here today. Um, I have to tell you that today I am recording today's service practically one year after we had shut everything down. And I was recording for the first time a sermon in this very sanctuary. Um, I think of all the things that I have learned, uh, just from technology to um, being able to, to have, a, have a, a circle light that uh, kind of enhances things. Um, but I thought it would be kind of nice to return back to the sanctuary, see if this, we could use this as a, as a staging area to record our devotional. And uh, so we're going to get right into it. Um, just a reminder that uh, what we're going to be talking about today is a uh, second Second part of the lesson from last week. Uh, if you remember, that was um, it, it was one where, where Nineveh um, dies and he and he goes to hell, and he is given an opportunity to go back and speak to his brothers, but he is only allowed to speak four words, and they have to come from Scripture. And so I stood up from the pulpit and I said those four words: "Woe to the complacent." And um, he said that over and over, and, and he worked really, really hard. But if you remember, Nineveh had no luck. None of his brothers would listen to him. It was certainly done out of love. He observed quite a bit from his brothers and, and their actions, but he didn't get very far. But in the end, the story actually worked out. Uh, Nineveh was so selfless so, and not selfish at all that he was able to receive his reward. So we ended the story right there because it was a long one. So we're going to get into another parable uh, that also takes place on that same day that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that um, uh, the dragon tells. And so as a reminder, this is on... Saturday, June 21st. So this is just another parable. And uh, I'll read that last paragraph again uh, from last week's lesson. The dragon's parable had opened several doors in my mind. As I was considering which of them to explore, he surprised me by saying, tuck that parable away and think about it later. I have one more for you today about another kind of conversion. Interesting. Okay. His name was Reverend Sam. He wore a black suit, a white shirt with a black shoestring tie and black cowboy boots. He drove a battered school bus that had been painted bright white. On top of the bus was a large cross, flanked by two flapping American flags. From behind them, two large trumpet-shaped loudspeakers blared out old-time gospel music. Half the bus was filled with giveaway Bibles, and the other half was the makeshift home of Reverend Sam. Painted in large red letters on either side of the bus were signs that read, Ban ERA, Gay Rights and Communism, but not the bomb. And repent and believe the good news. Across the front was, Jesus is Lord, and the back carried the slogan, God bless America first. As the Reverend Sam drove along, both hands gripping the steering wheel, his voice raised to accompany the taped Amazing Grace blasting from the speakers, he saw a hitchhiker ahead at the side of the road. He was a man in his late 20s or early 30s with a dark beard, old clothes, and a tattered backpack. The Reverend Sam slammed on the brakes, and the Bible bus came to a grinding stop. He flung open the door with a zestful, Praise the Lord! The hitchhiker looked up, smiled, and said, Good morning, beautiful day, isn't it? Climb aboard, stranger, replied the Reverend Sam. I'm headed up the road as far as the turnoff for Circleville. You might as well ride that far. The hitchhiker climbed into the seat beside Reverend Sam as he shifted gears, causing the old bus to lumber off with a medley of mechanical moans. Turning down the volume of Amazing Grace, the Reverend Sam asked with a big grin, have you, stranger, accepted Jesus as your personal Lord? At first, the hitchhiker didn't answer. 
Then he said in a quiet voice, as Lord? You mean my Lord? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have. But stranger, said the Reverend Sam with an expression of shocked belief, you will never be saved unless you do. That's my whole life, bringing folks to the love of Jesus, baptizing them and spreading the Bible far and wide. That's why I'm headed for Circleville, to preach a revival. Hitchhiker smiled and said nothing. The Reverend Sam lowered his head and, looking over the top of his glasses, just as Lyndon Johnson used to do, asked, Have you been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? Again, a long, silent pause. The hitchhiker finally answered, No, come to think of it, I just never thought it was, uh, I just never thought it was necessary. <gasps> what? exclaimed the Reverend Sam. Do you mean that you don't belong to a church? Do you mean, asked the hitchhiker, to, to one church? Yes, of course, said the Reverend Sam. How can anyone belong to more than one church? The truth is one. Either you believe or you don't. If you believe, as I'm sure you must, then you can be baptized and saved. The lips of the Reverend Sam parted in a slight smile as he thought to himself, I got myself a real live, genuine heathen ready for the waters of redemption. The Reverend Sam was the salvation salesman of the first order. He now rested his heavy hand on the arm of the hitchhiker and began a long, convincing sales talk on the necessity, the absolute necessity of being baptized. Up ahead was a sign to the right that read, Circleville, 10 miles. Pointing to a narrow road, winding alongside the main road was a clear water creek. Pulling the old bus to the shoulder of the road, the Reverend Sam took the stranger by the arm and marched him down to the creek. There he submerged him under the clear flowing waters and cried aloud, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. As the hitchhiker moved out of the water, the Reverend Sam shouted a long victory cry that was a rare combination of hallelujah, hip, hip, hee, and hooray. Then the Reverend Sam warmly wrapped up his arm round the wet shoulders of the silent hitchhiker and led him back up the road without ever really looking at him. Then he climbed alone into the bus and said, here's where we part company, brother. He handed the stranger a Bible and closed the door shouting, praise the Lord. The old white Bible bus with banners flapping roared off in a great gray cloud, heavy with oil and gas fumes. As he started up the narrow road that led to Circleville, the Reverend Sam wore a smile that translated, Mission Accomplished. He looked into his rearview mirror for one last glimpse of his most recent convert. But in his mirror, he could clearly see that the intersection of the two roads was empty. No one could be seen anywhere. What a strange story, I said when I had finished. It's like the Emmaus story turned inside out. The Reverend Sam was too busy preaching to see who the stranger really was. Yes, Igor replied, and I have a feeling that it is repeated more often than you or I might think. As the twilight of that June evening enveloped the garage, I was suffering from overdose. Truly, I needed time to sort out what these parables mean for me. Sensing my need to think, Igor bowed and slipped out the door without another word. Those two stories do puzzle me. In the first parable, Nineveh got rewarded for trying to change his brother's lives, even though they didn't listen. But in the other one, it seemed wrong for the Reverend Sam to preach at the hitchhiker the way he did. What's the difference between them? Was the Reverend Sam just collecting souls? Doesn't love have to be at the heart of all conversion? I decided to go in a different direction right now. Um, I, I want to focus on transformation. Uh, I have in mind a book that I used to read to my kids. In fact, we loved the book so much <clears throat> that uh, we actually had two copies of them. Um, <clears throat> they really didn't last after you, had, after you had three children, but that doesn't matter. It is The Very Hungry Caterpillar. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the story, <clears throat> um, this caterpillar comes along and he just eats 
and every page that you just open up, he's eating more. And you open up, and he's eating more, and he's just eating more, and the caterpillar's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Every time he eats, he's getting bigger and bigger, and he turns into a cocoon. And then you have this cocoon. It's this big, fat cocoon. And then at the end, it turns into this beautiful butterfly. Thought of that story in light of, of where we are in our experiences, but also in particular that whole idea of transformation. Um, this story is about conversion. This story is about transformation. This story really is about becoming something very different. And not just this story, but the story that we just read from previously about uh, Nineveh. Nineveh dies. He, he goes into an experience where he is in hell. He is given an opportunity to, to say some words to his, his brothers. Uh, it takes place. It doesn't go exactly the way he wants. In fact, nothing goes the way he is expecting. But something does occur, something that he did not expect. And then that's when the transformation happens. I think that's one of the reasons why we love the book so much is that all we see is this caterpillar getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then it just gets transformed into something else. I'm reminded of a quote that a good friend of mine, a clergy coach of mine, um, has said and and I'm going to uh, I'm going to try and and say it exactly the way that he has presented it to us although there is variations of it but the quote really speaks a lot to where we are today it goes like this change happens when something occurs that no one could imagine change happens when something occurs that no one could imagine. For Nineveh, the change happens when he is given a reprieve by Lazarus who says, Nineveh, you were so selfless. You didn't ask anything for yourself. Come on over. It's all for you. Story about Reverend Sam. <laughs> There's no change there. He's got an agenda. He's got something very in particular in mind. That's almost like that as the story goes, that almost like that Emea story that's now in reverse. Uh, if you're not quite familiar with it, it is one of my f utmost favorite of the gospel stories. Uh, it happens right after the resurrection. Jesus is walking along with some disciples, and um, they stop to eat. Jesus breaks the bread and disappears amongst them. It is a story where they have realized that they're not looking at the historical Jesus, something that happens before the resurrection. They are not looking. They were seeing the risen Christ. Transformation. Conversion. Something different. Change happens when we, when something happens, excuse me, change happens when something occurs that one could not imagine. Just like the butterfly that goes from a caterpillar and then it gets transformed into a cocoon which we all are familiar with this. And um, I like to think of the cocoon as, as almost like uh, the Saturday experience. Uh, so the, the caterpillar experience is, is where we learn all of the stories of Jesus. And uh, Jesus walks among us. Jesus is doing those great things. He is he's a liberator. He is, he is one that, that is teaching us some wonderful lessons. And then he dies. And then we're at um, 
we weren't Saturday. You know, it's kind of that in-between experience where uh, um, it's not the historical Jesus. We don't have Jesus with us anymore. Uh, but in that Saturday event, something different has, is taking place. We don't quite know what's going to happen on Sunday. Now, for us, we know the end of the story, but, but think of it back in the shoes of, of the Saturday experience. We don't quite know what's going to be taking place. We're in a cocoon. We're allowing change to take place. Kind of like the pandemic. Think of the pandemic as almost like a, uh, a Saturday experience. But remember, change happens when something occurs that no one could imagine. And that change occurs when out comes this absolutely beautiful butterfly. Where are we going to come out next? Hopefully it's not hate. But it certainly is love. It's going to be something that's going to be so selfless because we don't need to be selfish anymore. Jesus has done everything for us, made things so beautiful. Maybe that's what we're going to be on the other side of the pandemic. Maybe that's where it's going to be when we do find that Holy Grail. Now you're getting a sense of where St. George is being led in this story. It's all about conversion and about what he's going to become. Let us pray. <sighs> Dear Lord, you are a God of transformation. You are a God of conversion. You are a God of change. And remind us that change occurs when something happens that we did not expect. We didn't expect this pandemic. Maybe we didn't expect the butterfly. Maybe we didn't expect this story. Maybe we didn't expect that phone call. Maybe we didn't expect that, that event to take place. Maybe we didn't expect this and that. But these events lead us into unique and wonderful ways. I just ask that uh, you gather us in and remind us that we are people of the Easter story. We don't need to stay in Saturday because Sunday has already arrived. And for this, we are well aware that change is ever around us and that we can and will be transformed into something very different. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, very wonderful and uh, thought-provoking story. And uh, uh, until next week, take care.